Uh, good morning, everyone. Hola a todos, bienvenidos. Uh, soy David Ortiz, el director del Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos y de la Frontera aquí en New Mexico State University. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is David Ortiz. I am the faculty fellow for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies here at NMSU. And this is our last speaker of the fall 2023 series, and we are very honored to have him here with us sharing uh, a talk on his uh, latest research. So uh, today we have the honor to have with us Dr. Francisco Lara Valencia. Welcome, Dr. Lara Valencia. Uh, I will do a brief introduction of Dr. Lara Valencia. His actual CV is very, very long. So uh, I will um, do something uh, brief. Uh, but we are incredibly proud and incredibly honored to have him here. Uh, Dr. Francisco Lara Valencia is a professor of border studies and senior sustainability scholar at Arizona State University. He completed a BS in economics at the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California and an MA in regional development at El Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Mexico. He holds a PhD in urban planning from the University of Michigan. His major areas of inquiry are, include socio environmental vulnerability, urban health, regional development, binational planning, and the role of community networks on sustainable development. His policy research focuses on issues of equity and efficiency of policy making and planning along the US-Mexico border. As a border scholar, his scholarship is situated at the intersection of urban planning, community development and cross-border governance and cooperation. He is also past president of the Association of Borderland Studies and director of the Transborder Policy Lab. His talk today is titled Beyond Flood Risk Management on the US-Mexico Border, Achieving Environmental Justice and Flood Resilience Through Transborder Green Infrastructure Planning. Um, I will let uh, Dr. Valencia give his talk and if you all want to participate, um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, there you can, while uh, Dr. Lara Valencia is doing his talk, you can start adding questions and we will take all questions at the end and we will ask him those questions at the end. So without further ado, please uh, give a warm digital welcome to Dr. Lara Valencia. Thank you very much, uh, David, for this uh, introduction. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be here too. So thank you very much for for inviting me. I'm going to share my my PowerPoint uh, with uh, with everybody. I, I I hope you are you are seeing my my PowerPoint. So the title of the of the talk is uh, Beyond Risk Management on the U.S. Mexico Border. And uh, there are two uh, words that are key in the subtitle. One is environmental justice, and the other one is uh, flood uh, resilience uh, uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, Mexico border. Let me tell you uh, what is the motivation of this uh, this study I'm uh, presenting to you uh, today. Uh, the The project started years ago when we were asked. For the uh, by the EPA to do an analysis about uh, flood uh, control uh, issues in the in the Nogales in the Nogales area, we started working on that in around 2010, and then very soon we realized that uh, the the work that we were doing was not uh, going to be um, uh, meaningful in terms of changing anything in the. Uh, Ambos Nogales area, if we uh, kept thinking only on uh, flooding control, flooding management issues. So we realized that we had to move uh, beyond that um, uh, uh, understanding of the problem and incorporate uh, more broadly uh, social, social and um, equity issues that were really uh, critical uh, to this area. The other thing that we... Uh, realized very soon was that uh, we were making a, a mistake in uh, in thinking uh, in uh, Nogales, Sonora, Nogales, Arizona as two separate entities. Uh, uh, and further, 
we realized that in order to understand what was happening in Nogales, Arizona, we have to fully integrate uh, the uh, processes that connect uh, the, the two sides of the border. And when I said process that connect both two sides of the border, I'm talking about uh, the, the presence of uh, uh, the maquiladoras in, on the Mexican side, the influx of, of the US uh, and US policies to our migration in attracting uh, people into, into the region, the impact of uh, free trade uh, in the area, uh, those were aspects that really needed to be uh, included in the in the analysis of the issues of uh, vulnerability and risk that the city like Nogales Sonora, cities like Nogales Sonora, Nogales Arizona, uh, were facing. Um, so we start looking for an approach that allowed us to consider uh, the issue of uh, vulnerability and risk in a more uh, uh, broader way. And we came with these uh, ideas that were in vogue in, uh, in 2010, 2012, uh, which is uh, the idea of applying uh, nature-based solutions to uh, issues of uh, urbanization, in particular, uh, green infrastructure. We, we thought that at uh, that point that green infrastructure uh, in particular was a uh, uh, correct way to approach the issue of flooding and build resilience and bring equity uh, in the in the region uh, and connect uh, uh, the two uh, sides of the border. Thinking on the Nogales Sonora and Nogales Arizona as a as a as a unity uh, that is subject to uh, the, the the tensions and contradiction of the type of development that we see happening in the in the uh, U.S.-Mexico uh, uh, border. So uh, the, 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 the project quickly moved into exploring the, the uh, potential of green infrastructure to address all these issues uh, with the understanding that the border uh, by itself was a, a source of uh, tremendous challenges, but also uh, 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 provided some opportunities to uh, uh, address the, the issues that we were trying to uh, solve in, uh, in Nogales. In particular, we start, started thinking in, uh, in the watershed uh, in which the two cities are, are embedded. Uh, we have to use a different unit of analysis, uh, and that unit of analysis was, was the, the sub-basin of the Nogales wash, in which the two cities, Nogales Sonora and Nogales Arizona, are embedded. So my presentation is going to go through these three uh, main ideas. One, the role of uh, of uh, urbanization in, in creating uh, risk and vulnerabilities in the in the area, which is fueled by industrialization, trade, and migration. The second one is the the potential of uh, a nature-based solution, in particular green infrastructure, and in addressing some of the the uh, issues in the region, in particularly flooding and the issue of equity. Uh, and finally, trying to, uh, I'm gonna to try to explain how can we, um, uh, how, how can we um, uh, lever, leverage on the border to uh, uh, develop uh, a binational green infrastructure, green infrastructure network for Ambos and Nogales. Some um, contextual information, uh, Nogales, uh, uh, Sonora and Nogales, Arizona, were two cities that were, I mean, are archetypical of the U.S.-Mexico border in many, in many ways. Um, uh, okay, in many ways, uh, they were established more or less at the same time at the end of the 19th century with the coming of the railroad to the to the area. Uh, they were twin cities to some extent for for a time. But uh, in the 40s, they, they started to go their own uh, ways. Uh, you can see in this uh, graphic, uh, uh, the population uh, growth in Nogales, uh, Sonora, exploded, uh, exploded uh, uh, starting in the, in the 40s. It, uh, the divergence in demographic terms in the two cities really intensified in the cities, in the 60s with the arrival of the, of the maquiladoras. And right now, the two cities are uh, nothing uh, uh, close to uh, the, the, the concept of, of a twin city. Nogales Sonora right now has 
close to 275,000 uh, residents, while Nogales, uh, Arizona, is, is pretty much stagnant and losing population in the last uh, few years. Uh, you can see in the map the expansion of, of the city. Uh, the two cities are pretty much uh, connected uh, by, by the border and grew along the uh, causeway of the Nogales Wash that uh, started uh, in, uh, on the Mexican side and then crossed the border into, into, the, into the U.S. Into the US. Uh, the uh, urbanization is uh, is uh, is pretty much uh, um, uh, uh, perpendicular to uh, to the border, uh, and it forms a corridor which is about 13 kilometers long from the south of Nogales, Sonora, to the uh, uh, north uh, of Nogales, uh, Arizona. One very interesting aspect of the urbanization process in the area is because the forces I was describing uh, before er, uh, earlier, uh, Nogales, uh, Sonora is, is a very dense uh, city. You can see there, for example, the rate of expansion of uh, the city of Nogales between 1888 to 2020, uh, uh, the, the, the years of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the 20s uh, uh, were uh, a period of rapid, rapid expansion for the, for the city. But particularly in the 90s and 2000 uh, and the 2010 uh, decade were uh, uh, periods of rapid expansion too. One characteristic of the growth of Nogales uh, Sonora is that population has grown more rapidly than uh, the physical expansion of the city. So in consequence, densities tend to be uh, much higher in Nogales uh, Sonora than in Nogales Arizona. Uh, which uh, uh, explain some of the things I'm going to present uh, later in my presentation. I'm going to uh, uh, move uh, to some of the issues that uh, really uh, motivated this analysis. Uh, the type of urbanization that happened in the region obviously uh, created uh, issues like uh, fragmentation and the decline of the downtown areas, especially on the Mexican side. There are concerns about quality of life because the uh, uh, very high reliance on automobile for travel in the city and the issues of segregation and unequal access to jobs and services in the city. Uh, there is a tremendous deficit on, on open space and pu public space that is concentrated uh, in the uh, uh, more marginalized areas of, of the city. Um, there are concerns about water quality uh, in the in the area uh, because the pollution uh, not only uh, from uh, residential uh, wastewater uh, running on the street but also industrial pollution uh, obviously the issue of uh, flooding is a big concern and the impact of all these problems in quality of life and also in the finances of the of this of the city this as I said before the two cities are, uh, almost completely uh, nested within the boundaries of the Nogales uh, Wash, uh, which is uh, shared almost equally by, uh, by the two uh, countries. Uh, and uh, you can see in the map uh, around 55-60% of the area of the watershed is um, uh, covered by, uh, by the urban footprint of uh, both Nogales, which uh, compared the Nogales uh, Wash into a highly uh, impacted uh, by national uh, watershed. Uh, let me um, explain what are the implications of, of this. I'm, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with this type of um, uh, schema. Schema. This is a, a representation that we use in, in some of the uh, community activities we do in Nogales to explain the, the implication of urbanization on in particular, the water cycle uh, within and, and the watershed in the Nogales area. You can see here, for example, three stages. I mean, uh, the stage uh, where uh, no city is present, and uh, and um, and the monsoon that happened here in the in the summer or the winter rains that happen between December and February uh, will uh, basically. Uh, um, be infiltrated uh, into the into the ground, 
uh, or uh, uh, evaporated uh, into the atmosphere. Very few of the, of the water, uh, uh, when no CD is present, uh, will uh, become a, a, a runoff uh, uh, running on the surface of, of the city. This, this diagram uh, showing the first uh, visual uh, that 40% of the water or rain go, goes back to the atmosphere, 10% is runoff, and the rest is shallow infiltration and deep infiltration. With the city, those parameters change. Uh, the amount of evaporation uh, decrease, the amount of uh, infiltration also decrease, and uh, about 55% of the, of the rain runs on the surface and cause uh, issues like flooding in city. Uh, the alternative to uh, the problems created by urbanization that replace natural ground, ground with impervious surfaces is green in the city. So the last visual show you uh, that uh, cities can be renaturalized, bring back some vegetation uh, uh, through things like green infrastructure, and with that you will restore some of the uh, uh, functions that are lost in a, in a watershed as a result of of, of urbanization. So uh, in Nogales, uh, the the process of urbanization has created uh, many problems. I was I was explaining before. One of them is flooding. Uh, these images over here are images of the uh, 1930 uh, flood in Nogales, uh, Sonora and Nogales, uh, Arizona. It was, uh, uh, it was the, the, the major flooding event uh, recorded in the, in the city. Uh, that doesn't mean that there was not uh, flooding events uh, before. There were uh, uh, a few, but this one in particular was uh, uh, very uh, uh, significant because the magnitude of the destruction and also uh, the uh, loss of, of life. Uh, it was also the um, trigger of some of the uh, infrastructure uh, development that happened in the area in, uh, at the end of the 30s to try to control uh, the waters of the Chimeneas Wash and the Nogales Wash and reduce the risk of flooding in the in the Nogales area. It was reported uh, uh, widely in Mexico and the U.S. I mean, the New York Times uh, ran a, a couple of reports. This is a copy of a, a newspaper, a local newspaper, the Nogales International. They report um, uh, eighty thousand dollars in losses in Mexico, twenty thousand in the U.S., four or five uh, deaths. Uh, more of them from uh, of people from Nogales, Sonora, uh, that uh, some of their bodies were uh, recovered on on the Nogales wash in the U.S. side of the border, uh, and uh, and they describe a situation where there was uh, chaos because a lot of people was uh, uh, unhoused as a result of the of this event. This event even uh, resulted in a in a corrido. Uh, uh, this is El Corrido de la Inundación de Nogales de 1930, uh, which uh, is very interesting to, to listen because it, it provides a very good uh, uh, portrayal of what happened and who was involved uh, during the uh, process of um, helping people and also trying to uh, bring back uh, the, the, the cities, uh, 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 recover the cities from the, from the flooding. Um, this is a picture of Nogales in 19, uh, 1930. You can see uh, most of the uh, urbanization was in the lower valley of the Nogales Wash. Uh, the hills on the on the uh, east side of the city were starting to be uh, occupied by by people coming uh, to uh, work in uh, in Nogales, but uh, they were uh, mostly um, not used for uh, residential. Uh, activities. Uh, just to give you a sense of the type of transformation that happened in the city, this is an image I found yesterday, uh, uh, which uh, is about the same perspective. And you can see how the, the, the hills on the east side of the city now are occupied by uh, uh, mostly low-income people that arrived to Nogales in the 50s with, uh, with the expansion of the uh, railroad activity 
in the area. In these places, you have uh, colonias like El Embarcadero, Nuevo, Nuevo, uh, Buenos Aires, which are uh, uh, places that uh, lack services uh, and uh, are subject to uh, low risk because of the location of the of the housing. That in turn also affect the the area below, which is downtown uh, Nogales, uh, Sonora. One of the things I want to uh, uh, argue here is that yes, I mean, uh, flooding happened because there is the monsoon uh, uh, in Nogales, which is um, these uh, huge storms that are concentrated in a very short span of, of time during the months of June and, and August. Uh, and also we have the rains of, of the winter. But as you can see in this chart, um, uh, it's been interesting to see that um, the, the rain pattern uh, is pretty much uh, stable over a long period of time. You can see here from 1914 to 2022 uh, uh, data from, uh, uh, from NOAA. Uh, and one of the things I want to just highlight is uh, the effect of draw and uh, and the uh, uh, lack of precipitation uh, or the presence of lack of precipitation in the last uh, few years. There is a trend to uh, 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 less rain uh, in, in Nogales starting in the, in the, in the 2000s. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is important because one of the things that we uh, uh, highlight in the, in the analysis is that um, Nogales has been experiencing more intense and more uh, frequent uh, flooding events in the uh, in the last few years. This chart over here also comes from NOAA. Uh, is uh, is a chart that show you uh, flooding events, um, meaning uh, events that uh, 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 are the result of precipitation um, a little bit above the 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 average precipitation, which is four hundred and nine millimeters from Nogales uh, a year. Uh, and, uh, and these bars, the blue ones, uh, are uh, indicating events that produce some damage. And because uh, in, 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 the term, in the sense of uh, property destruction uh, 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 and were reported in, 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 in local uh, newspapers. So you can see here that uh, the uh, intensity, the, the frequency of these type of events and the intensity of these type of uh, events uh, increase starting in the 1978, uh, 1970, uh, the, at the end of the 1970s. Before we have some events, uh, we have obviously uh, the one in the 1930 that I mentioned before, uh, but uh, the, uh, we have some others in the 50s and 57, but the intensity and the frequency of these events increase uh, in the last three, uh, four decades uh, in Nogales, which coincides with the uh, rapid urbanization of the area. The red bars in the chart are uh, uh, events that also uh, included uh, fatalities. Uh, for example, in, 1920, in 1930, there were five deaths in addition to the destruction of housing and and infrastructure in the city. In the 57, there were three deaths. But you can see here at the end that, uh, the, again, the, the uh, frequency of events that include also fatalities intensified uh, in Nogales. And I put some picture here so you can see uh, the, uh, the seriousness of the issues in Nogales. The one on top is, is an image uh, of uh, flooding that happened in 2022. And the one at the bottom is a drawing that was uh, done by a middle school student uh, in one of the workshops that we organized in, in Nogales. And you can see the, the similarities of uh, what uh, the camera of a, uh, a journalist capture and the representation of the events by a, a 12 years old uh, girl in Nogales, uh, Sonora. So what is the 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 Take away from this, uh, uh, we have to bring into the uh, equation the effect of uh, urbanization in general, but in particular, the type of urbanization that happened in Nogales to uh, address the issue of flooding. And we have to act upon uh, that uh, fact 
in order to uh, uh, mitigate uh, the problem. In particular, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the problem with, uh, with Nogales is uh, the fact that um, the, the organization substituted uh, uh, natural cover with hard surfaces that uh, intensify uh, the, 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 the process of uh, flooding risk in the, in the area. And in the uh, in the process, also uh, work rate, uh, inequities were created in terms of access to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, amenities and infrastructure, but also in terms of exposing uh, particular uh, groups to the uh, risk of uh, of flooding. Uh, so what we have done in uh, more recent uh, uh, years is uh, to explore the potential of of green infrastructure. I'm going to explain how we did it. Uh, the idea of, of the project uh, that we uh, initiated in 2020, uh, which the support of the North American Development Bank and the Border 2020 uh, Environmental Program was to uh, develop a plan to uh, uh, create a binational network of green infrastructure for Ambos uh, Nogales. Green infrastructure is uh, basically uh, uh, an approach that try to renaturalize a city, trying to restore some of the uh, ecological functions that are lost as a result of urbanization. Uh, it's a low cost uh, uh, approach uh, and it can be used as a part of a, a, a planning strategy. That, that's the way we uh, approach it. Uh, normally is used to uh, reduce flooding hazards, uh, but we decided, as I explained before, that we can um, use this approach to uh, promote equity and resilience in the in the, in the city. So this this um, uh, way to approach green infrastructure require the formation of um, of uh, an interdisciplinary team of. Um, uh, researchers and experts that uh, were in charge of uh, developing the different co uh, components of, of, of the project. In particular, we needed um, uh, to work with uh, an expert in hydrology that uh, uh, was in charge of updating the um, models, uh, the hydrological models in the, in the area. We needed someone uh, helping us with the evaluation of the institutional regulatory framework uh, that uh, make possible or or not the application of green infrastructure in Nogales, Sonora, Nogales, Arizona, and facilitate co cooperation. We also uh, needed to um, increase the awareness uh, in the community about the possibilities of this approach. Um, and, uh, and, and also we needed to develop some uh, visual renderings of the concepts that we were um, uh, proposing so the community can uh, uh, engage with the uh, proposal that we were making. One very important aspect of all the process, and this is directly connected with uh, the idea of developing a binational plan of green infrastructure for Nogales, is the, the city, the location of the different uh, solutions or the different interventions that we're going to propose as, as part of this um, uh, this uh, uh, the project. Uh, so the land suitability analysis is uh, one of the components in which I was uh, most directly involved. And what I'm going to do is to explain very briefly how we did it and what were the results of, of this uh, this activity. Um, so uh, it's a multidisciplinary uh, uh, project uh, trying to uh, uh, develop a proposal to create a, a green infrastructure uh, by national network for both Nogales, bringing back nature and reconnecting the two cities uh, or linking the two cities as a, as a unity. Uh, so we need to decide where to put all these interventions. Uh, and, uh, and these interventions uh, uh, have to uh, take advantage of the multifunctionality of green infrastructure to address not only the flooding issue, but also to uh, help, for example, to improve uh, uh, water quality in the watershed and also uh, improve uh, recreational opportunities, green space opportunities for the community 
of Nogales, uh, Sonora and Nogales, Arizona, as if they were uh, 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 a city, a unity. Uh, two questions need to be uh, answered um, uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, particular uh, effort to decide where to put uh, the, the interventions. Uh, one is, uh, what do GI technologies need for optimal functioning? And the second one, what is the need for the benefit of GI technologies uh, 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 the highest? That's, that's, those are the two questions. Two questions that uh, are part of this framework proposed by uh, Cooler and colleagues. Uh, they basically suggest that traditional land suitability analysis is pretty much focused on, on, uh, uh, on the needs of the technology, but uh, uh, they don't, uh, uh, they, they don't, um, it's not uh, consider the, the, who is going to benefit from the technology and where the, the uh, result of the uh, uh, seeding of the intervention is going to produce the highest social impact. So it's a, it's a two-sided uh, approach in which you need to um, look at things like uh, uh, slopes, soil characteristics, land uses, uh, and land cover, uh, and also the availability of land for the construction or whatever uh, GI uh, intervention uh, you decide. But also you have to look at uh, where uh, the opportunities, for example, for uh, green space uh, uh, can be uh, accessed by the largest uh, amount of people uh, or the people that need it the most because they don't they, they lack access to those to those things. So the issue of equity, the issue of hazard reduction, and the uh, characteristic of the population that live in these areas is critical in the in the process of deciding where to locate these different uh, activities. Uh, so this is represented over here. I'm just going to show you uh, the specifically what what were the the, the the vectors that we included in the in the decision about where to seat the different interventions. For example, focusing on the needs of the technology. Uh, we obviously uh, look at the slope, uh, the soil uh, uh, infiltration capacity, and the compatibility, compatibility of land uses. And in terms of the benefits, uh, uh, reduction hazard and, and, and given access to green space opportunities, we look at issues like the imperviousness, the elevation, the uh, city streets that are subject to uh, intense runoff during the monsoon, uh, the protection of waterways, the control of pollution hotspots, mostly near industrial parks, uh, the potential of ground, groundwater recharge, uh, and the population density and, uh, and green space equity in the, in the different cities. This is, uh, this is uh, in, term, in general terms, this, the, the um, framework that we use to decide what spaces in the city were more appropriate for the uh, intervention. Here is a, uh, a, a, a visual uh, representing the, the geographical analysis. Uh, uh, in, in the top, you can see, for example, how the uh, uh, land suitability analysis was done uh, for the uh, uh, decision regarding green space opportunities. Uh, in the first map, you, you can see, for example, uh, the network of uh, major roads in both sides of the city. Uh, uh, the second one shows you the uh, population density in, uh, in both sides of the border, uh, the distribution of parks, public parks in the city, and the identification in dark and green and brown dark, uh, the areas that lack access to public parks. And then at the end, the combination of these three layers of data into the identification of the uh, areas that uh, will be benefit the most with the uh, application of uh, the, the construction of green infrastructure. At the bottom is uh, is a process that include the, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 16 uh, uh, factors that were included for each of the dimensions of the analysis. 
For example, the first one is just uh, 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 the feasibility of the area to support green infrastructure. Uh, the second one is uh, the uh, composite map uh, where we can intervene and mitigate flooding. Uh, the third one is water protection. And the last one is the same that is on top, which is GIS opportunity. The result of combining uh, these uh, four dimensions is uh, what you see as the new uh, uh, green infrastructure most suitable sites in the last uh, map of the uh, slide. These are the areas, the zones that we identify through this exercise. Um, these are just focus area. We have not made any decision at this point about what to do in those places. These are simply uh, 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 zones within the watershed uh, that uh, can be uh, further explored uh, to uh, apply green infrastructure. Uh, we use this uh, decision matrix to select sites uh, within uh, the two uh, the two cities. Uh, this require a uh, visit to the areas. This require sometimes the use of Google Earth uh, to explore some of the of the places. But uh, a group of um, uh, technicians from the uh, uh, Nogales uh, Planning Institute and some students from the University of Arizona help us to uh, visit the different zones that we didn't identify through the land suitability analysis and uh, and identify a total of 103 sites in both Nogales that uh, are particularly suitable for the uh, uh, creation of, uh, of infrastructure. You can see them over here in, uh, in, in dark green, in the 100 city, 103 sites on both sides. Uh, uh, most of them are on the Mexican side. Uh, and uh, one other thing that is uh, uh, important to highlight is that the area of the sites on Nogales, Arizona tend to be a little bit larger than in uh, the Nogales, uh, Sonora side simply because of the type of urbanization that have happened on, on the two areas. Uh, further, um, uh, uh, we um, uh, uh, selected some of these places uh, for uh, the demonstration of the, of, of the possibilities of the uh, uh, technology in, in both Nogales. I'll show you uh, that in a moment, but here is a, a summary of the, of the characteristic of the different sites that we identify. Most of them are public schools and parks uh, or sport facilities uh, on both sides uh, of the world. You can see that in the in the chart. And this is because in the uh, land survey analysis, a criteria that really um, was emphasized was uh, uh, the accessibility of, um, of the area and, and also the, uh, um, the, the potential of being uh, adapted uh, to the technology, what necessarily uh, uh, led to uh, the selection of schools and public parks and other public areas uh, in the in the uh, final analysis. Um, we tested the, the uh, impact on the water budget of the 103 sites. Uh, uh, Laura Norman from the USGS and uh, uh, Margaret Garcia from uh, ASU uh, run uh, a model. Uh, and it was really interesting to see that even when the number of sites uh, that we proposed uh, were not uh, a significant um, um, area within the watershed, they, they have the potential to uh, uh, improve some of the uh, parameters that uh, are of concern for uh, city managers and uh, uh, risk managers in uh, in Bodno Gales. Uh, for example, uh, they estimated that uh, if these sites were going to be uh, transformed into green infrastructure, uh, with a lot of assumptions, I don't want to go into details, uh, there can be a reduction in the runoff, uh, there can be a reduction in peak, uh, flow, there can be also a reduction in in, uh, in the production of sediments uh, in the in the area. Both in each of the 
planes that were identified through the application of the Kineros modeling that uh, Laura and uh, Margaret Garcia used, but also on the streams that uh, are uh, uh, prominent in the within the watershed. Uh, this is more information about the uh, the modeling. Uh, there are a lot of variations, but in general, the, the 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 trend that was observed before is that if these places are going are uh, transforming to uh, 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 GI solutions, they can really uh, have an impact on, um, on sediments, uh, peak flow, and uh, runoff in the in the Nogales area. These are some of the uh, sites that we uh, identify as a um, good fit to uh, do a more specific uh, uh, design proposal uh, to explore with the, with the community uh, and eventually uh, transform them into uh, actual uh, interventions. Um, let me uh, see, um, all right. Let me see. These are some of the examples of the type of um, renderings uh, that were developed by uh, students from the University of Arkansas working with uh, Professor Gabriel Diaz Montemayor. This is for one of the, the planes on Nogales, Sonora, uh, the west side. Uh, the anchor of the area is a, is a middle school, Secundaria 3 in Nogales, Sonora. In that particular uh, a place uh, in that particular middle school, we uh, work with the uh, with the teachers and the the principal and the students to and uh, to develop a small uh, pilot uh, uh, project. Uh, we constructed uh, a rain garden with three micro basins uh, using this uh, landscape uh, plan for the for the school. Uh, this is the the areas where you can intervene to retain uh, uh, water in the within the school campus uh, and uh, help to mitigate the issue of uh, flooding that affect this part of the city. Obviously, we didn't have the time, neither the resources to do all the whole plan. So we decided to focus in uh, one specific site, uh, which is this uh, uh, cancha uh, or soccer field on the uh, south side of the of school. Here is the, the, the process that we follow with the students. We invite them to, to a workshop uh, in which they learn the basic concept of green infrastructure, the impact the urbanization has in, in flooding. Uh, we ask them about uh, their own experience as, as uh, uh, residents of the, of the city. And then they explore the, the, their campus, their school, and identify sites uh, where they can uh, do something. Uh, it was uh, really uh, interesting. And then we built the the, the rain garden on the uh, soccer field of the school, next to the soccer field of the school. You can see here the, the parents and students and other volunteers uh, building the, the, uh, the rain gardens in the school. This is an example of the uh, type of things that we propose for Nogales, Arizona. We are trying to uh, uh, do some of these projects. Uh, work, we're working on that. This is another example uh, of the type of um, um, concepts that we propose to the community. This is in a, in a neighborhood uh, to the west of uh, Nogales. It's an it's a, uh, area called El Embarcadero. It's a colonia that was formed in the in the fifties. Uh, is a is a, uh, I mean, is an area that lack uh, uh, services, lack parks. So we we talked to the, the residents, and uh, and and they were doing a lot of the things that we were proposing to do. I mean, they already uh, 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 har they were harvesting water, rainwater, and they were growing food in, on the hillside of the of the uh, uh, area where they live. And here, here are some of the uh, pictures uh, uh, depicting what we did in the in the area, uh, a meeting with the neighbors talking about the, the project and asking them about what they wanted to see happening in the, in the area. This was 2020 uh, uh, and it was also very interesting. And this is an idea that we proposed for the, for the city of Nogales, Arizona. Uh, right now, 
we are uh, working uh, uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in the construction of the networks. It has been a little bit more difficult, uh, but uh, we were able to uh, get some money from from uh, the U.S. Uh, government to uh, work with uh, middle school uh, teachers and students in in Nogales. Uh, this is a project uh, in which uh, ASU the University of Arizona and the Colegio de la Frontera Norte are, are working together. What we have done is to invite teachers of Nogales to uh, give us some ideas of the type of things that uh, they would like to do uh, in their schools to uh, to improve uh, uh, the um, uh, to improve the landscape and contribute to the reduction of uh, flooding risk in the area. We we uh, selected six schools middle schools in Nogales uh, to work with teachers uh, using a train-the-trainer model. Uh, so these are these are the teachers uh, working with uh, us in last in September, mid-September. Uh, we uh, teach them uh, and, and give them uh, educational materials they can use in their own teaching uh, based on the concept of green infrastructure and, and, uh, and, and resilience. Uh, and and then they uh, in November, early November, they use these uh, materials and these concepts to teach their own uh, students. Uh, and uh, here, he, he, you can see some of the images where the students are uh, uh, making uh, decisions about where to seat uh, rain gardens in their own schools. And then showing uh, their their proposals. All the uh, material on the back uh, of the uh, tier picture is material that we develop uh, uh, with information about the local hydrology and uh, and uh, and with information about the uh, the things that the community has been doing to address uh, flooding issues in uh, in Nogales. Um, the uh, next step in this process is the construction of rain gardens in in the six schools, um, and probably that will happen in the spring of uh, next next year. So, uh, this is the work that we have done. Uh, uh, it has been a, 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 a long process. Uh, uh, it has been also very uh, revealing uh, in 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 the way that. Uh, there is an obvious need to um, expand the, the 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 view of the uh, issue of, of flooding uh, hazards in the in the area are the uh, result of uh, urbanization, the type of urbanization which at the same time is directly connected with the with with the border. Uh, the argument that we have been uh, doing is that. Um, uh, the border is not a passive uh, actor in the in the creation of, of risk of vulnerability. It's actually um, a force uh, underlying these this, uh, these processes, and uh, and we have to find ways to uh, uh, overcome that uh, that uh, effect of the border on, on vulnerability. Use use the border as a as a resource. Uh, and uh, and leverage in the opportunities that the that the border uh, uh, give us in that sense. One way is uh, to uh, erase the border uh, from from the, the the planning planning process. Uh, start uh, thinking on uh, environmental issues uh, using uh, different geography, not the geography that is defined by the border itself. But the geography is defined by uh, geographic by natural units like the like the watershed. Try to bring uh, into the conversation the views of the of the local uh, uh, residents uh, and uh, and and the democratize the uh, the analysis and the decision making uh, process. One of the things that we have learned, for example. Is that uh, a lot of the people that is in charge of developing policies and programs to these issues of uh, vulnerability in the area are uh, pretty much uh, in um, disciplinary and professional silos 
Uh, and obviously, they are also constrained by their uh, territorial views of the uh, environmental issues on the border. So by bringing into the uh, conversation the view of teachers, the view of children, the view of other actors, uh, we believe that we are contributing to expand the uh, understanding of, of, of these issues. And by explicitly incorporating the issue of equity uh, is uh, is also um, uh, is uh, is also uh, I think, uh, a, a central aspect in the in the construction of of a more democratic space in the in the context of 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 the border. There are a lot of work to do, um, uh, but uh, I I'm convinced that uh, through this uh, collaboration. With, uh, with teachers, uh, with uh, the community, and also uh, uh, using this interdisciplinary perspective of, of the issue, I think uh, we can um, really um, uh, plan the, uh, put the seeds for, for uh, a different future in the, in the area. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that will take time require a lot of uh, energy, dedication, but I have the impression that we've created a, a group that is uh, uh, committed uh, to, to this effort in the, in the Nogales area. So I'm gonna stop over there. Uh, in, in case you have some comments or questions, I would like to hear from you. Uh, I'm seeing some names here uh, of people that I know is uh, is expert on this area, uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate if you can give us some some uh, feedback on what we have done in in the Nogales area. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Lara Valencia. This was fascinating. Um, we have a lot of questions already, so I will um, I will start by posing those. I have some questions of my own, but I'll start posing some of the ones that that people have asked already. Um, uh, Mohamed Rahman asks, regarding the slide presenting maps of the two Nogales, um, how does the population change in the adjacent two cities and urbanization in the last four decades impact the Santa Cruz River ecosystem? Well, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm sure you notice is that uh, the map showing the expansion of the two cities is uh, is uh, is only on the Mexican side, uh, not in the U.S. side. So that's that's uh, that's work that need to be uh, need to be done. Uh, uh, but at the same time, it reflects the the fact that uh, most of the concerns uh, about the the impact on urbanization on the on the area comes from the growth of the city of Nogales Sonora. Uh, I mean, most of the uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, impact, for example, water quality and create hazard are on the on the Mexican side of the border. I mean, it's not uh, an accident that uh, 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 most of the uh, destruction and most of the uh, loss of life that happened uh, with flooding are, are uh, all of them, all of them, the fatalities, all of them are concentrated on the on the Mexican side. Uh, I mean, we have reviewed the, the, the records uh, uh, about uh, these events, and we have not found any uh, report of fatalities linked with the monsoon or linked with the winter rains in the Nogales, Arizona side of the border. So, uh, yeah, uh, there is a, a, a direct connection with the issues uh, uh, of uh, water quality uh, on, with the type of uh, urbanization that happened on the Mexican side. Yeah, and I, I, there's another question that's related to that, um, which is, you know, about the impact of waste management um, uh, based on both the border wall and the maquiladoras, given those two things happening, um, you know, what's the, the, the impact of of those two things on, on the two cities. But most importantly, uh, uh, I think is the question is, can other adjacent border cities such as El Paso and Juarez learn any policy lessons from those impacts on climate change based on water and waste management system? 
what we have trying to do is to um, uh, being in a in a in a framework that can be replicated in uh, other border uh, places. Uh, so uh, uh, in deciding what factors, including the lens feasibility analysis, uh, for example, we uh, deliberately decide to include um, uh, information variables that are uh, readily available on both sides of the border that are more or less uh, um, comparable. Uh, uh, so it can be easily replicated in uh, in other uh, border uh, areas uh, because information is is existing in, in on both sides. Uh, and and after saying that after saying that I have to uh, really um, make a, a, a caveat here. I mean. Um, it's, it's not easy. If, uh, for example, information about soils, um, uh, infiltration capacities, uh, the uh, classifications um, of soils are different in the US and Mexico. We have to use uh, information from FAO to uh, do the analysis. The level of resolution of the data is sometimes not uh, the, the, the optimal for this type of analysis, uh, but we did as, as, as much as we can to uh, get very uh, specific details. Uh, regarding the issue of climate change, obviously it's a, it's a factor. Uh, the the, the uh, intensification and increased frequency of uh, 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 severe storms in the, in the area is, is clearly captured by the uh, information that I was uh, presenting. But one of the things that we want to, wanted to emphasize through this analysis is the, the 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 role of the type of urbanization, uh, the, the the type of city that has been built in the area, and the connection with uh, with uh, with bordering uh, in general in the in, in the region. So uh, uh, this is important because uh, if if I believe that if you emphasize on the uh, the importance of uh, Local factors uh, in 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 the creation of this uh, hazard and this vulnerability. Also, uh, 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 you are making a, a, an argument for uh, local action. I mean, uh, when you present this information to uh, local planners, to architects, to developers, they understand that there is a clear need to modify the way that uh, urban development has happening in the in the area. That's very interesting um, because th this next question is incredibly related to that. Kai McKinney asks, many solutions to flooding and issues with groundwater penetration involve altering the urban landscape in ways that make it less of a commodity for capital. Uh, did you experience any resistance to these efforts? Um, some, some. Uh, yes, as I recently had a conversation with with a person in Nogales, uh, Arizona, that was um, uh, saying, um, I mean, what you're proposing is 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 probably not the the, the best way to approach the the issues. Uh, she said uh, to me, I mean, building these little uh, dams. That's the way he she expressed the idea. I mean, building these little dams, the 103 dams in the city will resolve the problem. We need to build a huge dump in the in the Mexican side. And that will help us to uh, get the water that we need for uh, future development and also create development opportunities uh, in, uh, on, in, on the Mexican side. So uh, there is this uh, um, resistance to to the idea of uh, mm, using approaches that are, uh, uh, I mean, are distant from the uh, conventional ways to uh, to manage tonal water in in a city. Uh, uh, we don't present this uh, this proposal as a as a, um, 
as a, a solution to the problem. Uh, what we have been uh, saying from the beginning is that uh, we believe that green infrastructure can be used as a as a, a complement to uh, more conventional approaches to stormwater management, uh, like great infrastructure. And uh, and I I think that uh, that's give us some space to uh, engage in a conversation with uh, with people that don't see the 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 benefits of this perspective. That's very interesting. That the solution that the person you were talking about proposed for an issue that has been caused in in part by urbanization was more urbanization <laughs> mm -hmm. let's construct a big dam <laughs> um instead of rethinking of well how do we actually make sure nature takes care of 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 the problem the way that it used to be taken care of before urbanization yeah. so that it's very interesting um i have uh, another question that says here uh, disagreements over water rights in borderland watersheds have shaped who has access to the groundwater and for what purposes how do existing water rights in the nogales watershed affect the distribution of the benefits you mentioned uh um i i'm not sure i can comment on that in part because we don't have information about uh groundwater uh in the in the area uh, and uh, and we don't have information about groundwater rights in uh, in in Nogales, uh, Arizona, where more information exists. Uh, there are issues about water rights in connection with wastewater being produced in uh, in Mexico and sent across the border to the Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, I mean, uh, since 1973, I think so. Uh, uh, the city of Nogales, Sonora, sends all his wastewater for treatment in the in an, uh, binational wastewater treatment plant located in Rio Rico. Uh, Mexico sent, uh, I, I think, uh, about 14 million of gallons per day of wastewater to be treated in that plant and then uh, placed in the Santa Cruz River. Uh, is a very important resource. Uh, for uh, places like Tubac, for example, uh, or even for the research, research of aquifers in the city uh, of Tucson. And, uh, and obviously this wastewater has a, has a, a value, an economic value. Uh, and uh, now, right now there are some uh, discussions about uh, if that uh, value can be uh, transferred back to Mexico uh, of if Mexico can use that water, or even uh, there are some people suggesting that maybe Mexico should send more wastewater into Nogales, the Nogales International Treatment Plan, uh, to increase the availability of resource of the resource in in, in, in Santa Cruz County and Pima County. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean it, it's an interesting issue. Uh, uh, but I believe that uh, we don't we don't have uh, uh, enough information about this. Um, another question here regarding green infrastructure technologies. Are we also referring to artificial intelligence application? Um, if so, how does AI can be utilized in binational initiatives? Is there any policy in existence between U.S. And Mexico for AI usage in green infrastructure? Uh, no idea, and I, I'm, I'm. Uh, if you have any uh, suggestion, <laughs> please share it with us. I mean, we'll be interested in in exploring that that avenue. That was uh, Mohammed Rahman. I think uh, he's at uh -huh. UTEP in philosophy. So, Mohammed, if 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 you do have some ideas, please uh -huh. do contact uh, Dr. Lara Valencia. Yeah. Um, um, I'm going to move on to another one here. Um, sometimes in the U.S. side of the border, we often notice that several infrastructure barriers bypass federal laws regarding environmental protection. Regarding GI, are we going to confront similar wavering policies or, polit or politics both in the U.S. Of and Mexico sides? Well, there are differences uh, in the 
way uh, uh, green infrastructure is being uh, uh, approached on Mexico and, and the U.S. Um, uh, I mean, in, in, on, in Arizona, uh, Tucson has been doing uh, a lot. The Pima County and the city of Tucson, in particular, have been doing a lot of progress in uh, in modifying the uh, uh, city codes to facilitate the uh, adoption of green infrastructure. Uh, actually, uh, a lot of the people that was involved in this project was. Uh, 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 individuals that are part of local efforts in in Tucson to to facilitate uh, the uh, use of these uh, uh, approaches. Uh, so we have a, a lot of things to uh, to do on the Mexican side to really uh, meet the, the advancement that has been done in in, in in Pima. Santa Cruz County Nogales uh, has not um, done much. Uh, there's, there's still uh, uh, a lot of things to be done over there. Nogales, uh, Sonora, uh, has uh, modified their their uh, construction code uh, and, uh, and create incentives for the adoption of green infrastructure in new developments. Uh, uh, and uh, and that's, that's uh, the result of uh, some uh, initiatives that were uh, promoted by the, the Board of Environmental Cooperation Commission in 2014, 2015, when Marilena Giner was there. Uh, 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 new uh, laws were uh, passed at the state of Sonora and handbooks and uh, other guides were developed for uh, cities to start uh, adopting uh, green infrastructure. So. What I'm saying here is that the the regulatory landscape landscape is not uh, is not uniform. There are uh, differences. Uh, 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 if we focus in in Nogales, Sonora, Nogales, Arizona, alone, I would say that uh, regulation is more advanced on the Mexican side than in the U.S. Uh, side. Uh, the conversation that we have had with uh, people in, in the area is always like, in Nogales, Arizona, it's always like we need to learn from our neighbors to the south because they're they are doing the right thing. The problem in Nogales, Sonora, is that um, the implementation of these uh, uh, regulations is, is kind of, uh, is kind of uh, complicated. Uh, but is there, is there, and there has been some Good examples of uh, new developments uh, uh, adopting the the approach, but obviously more needs to be done. It's it's good to know that there's uh, at least uh, goodwill and changes to policies for uh, green infrastructure, which is which is encouraging. Um, a couple of more questions. Um, you mentioned that in Arizona, you work with students to teach them to implement these changes while in the Embarcadero area. Uh, residents were already practicing many of these methods you were proposing. Did you encounter different relationships with personal responsibility to engage in risk management and flood prevention versus seeing it as the purview of government and NGOs? So in other yeah. words, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, oh, let's see. Mm, I think that... Uh, for us was not uh, a surprise to come across these uh, examples of uh, communities uh, using these technologies. I mean, because uh, green infrastructure is nothing new. I mean, uh, in Mexico, we call them trincheras, okay? Uh, so uh, they were using trincheras uh, in one of the of the colonias and, and they were acting upon a very concrete necessity. They don't have water on top of that hill uh, and they saw uh, uh, an opportunity by uh, creating these small trincheras on the hillside of Colonel Embarcadero. And they were producing food for their uh, own consumption. Uh, they were not using uh, rocks, for example. We didn't use rocks in the school. They were using uh, soda bottles filled with uh, soil. And they were creating these amazing uh, structures on, near their, their homes. Uh, and uh, 
I mean, we haven't returned to the place uh, after we were there in 2021, 20, but I'm sure they're, they're still doing these things uh, with our, our present. I mean, the level of, of commitment is stronger than the commitment that we can uh, demonstrate uh, coming from, from an academic uh, uh, project like the one we were doing. I mean, I, I feel bad not being able to return but uh, uh, those those communities uh, keep doing what they have been doing for for years, uh, uh, being as present or not. Yeah, there is a difference. That's great. I have one last question since we're running out of time. Um, it, it's a beautiful question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but it's still interesting given what you said about uh, at the end of the idea of thinking of not geographical borders since this is thinking of, of natural borders and not political borders, right? Um, the question is, how can border watersheds work to reconceptualize the collective identities in terms of belonging to a shared ecosystem rather than a nationality? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good, a very good question. I mean, that's something that uh, we believe is, is possible. Um, but uh, hard to do. Uh, uh, for example, uh, mm, uh, we, as part of these last activities that we have done with teachers and students, uh, we uh, do focus groups and, and did some surveys with the teachers and the students. And um, there is a, a, a absence of uh, understanding of uh, the ecology and the geography of of the place. There is a uh, an issue of not knowing what is beyond the the border, uh, uh, not only what is uh, in your own side. Uh, so I I think that we can uh, uh, increase awareness and uh, and and help to develop an identity that is connected with nature rather than with uh with uh with uh, uh national identity or, or national factors but uh it's it's a it's a it's a long way to go uh this is why we decided to start working with uh with children uh i think that children have a better chance to develop that type of an understanding of the place where they live, especially when you have this very large uh, uh, binational uh, uh, population in uh, in Nogales. I mean, uh, I, I I I see the children uh, moving back and forth in the morning for schooling, uh, and, uh, and 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 that's something that we should tap on. This is why we want to extend the project to uh, Nogales, Arizona. For now, we have been working in, on the Mexican side, but the idea is to do this on, on, on both sides. Create an identity based on, on, the, uh, on the ecology of the place, uh, develop uh, an understanding of uh, the connections that exist, uh, uh, regardless of the political boundary, and, uh, and then uh, create a... Uh, a uh, impetus for uh, uh, protection of the of the environment in the in the area, uh, again, regardless of, of of the political boundary. Well, that's fascinating, and I hope I hope you're successful. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Lara Valencia, for your talk. It was incredibly uh, fascinating to to learn a lot about this. Uh, it was incredibly fascinating to see the efforts that you're doing with children in colonias, et cetera. And it's incredible to, to see how a little few projects, right? Uh, kind of uh, smaller projects are paying dividends and starting to, to change the culture of how we think of urbanization and green infrastructure and urbanization and, and green infrastructure as resilience and resistance, which I think is it's fascinating. So. Again, on behalf of my colleagues, Christopher Brown, Berta Bermudez Tapia, Neil Harvey, Marta Chavez, which are part of the speaker series committee of CLABS and myself, we thank you very, very much for, for your talk today. Uh, to everyone who participated, uh, also thank you for being here and your kind questions. Uh, Dr. Lava Valencia, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you again. 
Muchas gracias, David. Un placer eh, y fue un honor. Espero eh, verlos pronto otra vez. Hasta luego. Cla claro que sí. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for participating and staying and all your questions. Uh, please don't forget to follow us on all of our social media. NMSU Clabs is our social media if you want to know what we're organizing for next semester. Uh, gracias a todos por participar. Gracias a todos por estar aquí y por escuchar al Dr. Francisco Lara Valencia. Eh, síganos, por favor, en nuestros uh, medios sociales. Aquí estamos. Eh, todas nuestras cuentas son NMSU Clabs. Eh, nos vemos el siguiente semestre. Muchas gracias.